Let the poor man say I am rich in him Let the lost man say I am found in him Let the blind man say, I can see again. Let the dead man say, I am born again. Let the river flow. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your hand of blessing on each person here tonight, Lord, as we turn our hearts and our eyes and our ears and uh, 
our brain to you, Lord, tonight, and just pray that you would open all of those things and cause us to see you in a new light, to learn something new about you tonight, we pray, and trust in you, Father, because we know that's what you desire for each one of us, Lord. And thank you so much. In Jesus' holy name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Tanya. No, I'm kidding. It was, that was me. Yeah. Thank you for that worship. It's a little hot up here. Holy Spirit, come. Move in our hearts. Welcome back to our study in Hebrews. We are now reaching the home stretch as we will take a look tonight at chapter 10. And before we do, please, would you bow your heart with me? Father, we love you and we are so grateful for how much you love us. And Lord, we are standing before your word knowing that you and you alone are the author and the teacher of this word. So Father, please help us to be out of the way. Help us all to hear from you in your word and that your voice is the only one that we hear tonight. And God, just move in our hearts wherever it is that you want this word to find lodging tonight, that Lord, that we will be receptive and let you be our teacher and leader and guide in all things. And we give you glory, praise, and honor for all that you're going to do in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, really quickly, we'll look at this from a 30,000 foot level as we land on chapter 10 tonight, as a hat tip, hat tip to George. We've watched throughout this book, this chapter, as the author has made compelling case after compelling case during this whole first nine chapters as to why his audience should endure, should hold on tight to their faith in Jesus rather than give in to their persecution in order to somehow ease their physical lives here. We've seen Jesus is the God man better than angels. We've seen Jesus is an apostle better than Moses. We've seen that he is a leader better than Joshua. He is a priest better than Aaron. He is a priest after the superior order of Melchizedek. And finally, Jesus is a better sanctuary and a better sacrifice, thereby making this a better covenant. Therefore, Jesus, better than all things you have previously clung to, is your new and better deliverer. So if you lose everything, but still have Jesus, you've lost nothing. So we land at Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to look at the first three verses together. Hebrews 10 verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. So since all the procedures under the law provided only a shadow of what lay ahead, they could neither duplicate nor could they illuminate what those shadows were pointing to. And because there were only shadows of a much greater reality and not the real thing, the law then could never perfect the worshipers with those yearly sacrifices. And verse 2 poses this text. If sacrifices under the law could have perfected them, they wouldn't have needed to continue those sacrifices. In verse 3, though, rather those sacrifices performed under the law served as a regular reminder of sins, the price of sins, the cost of life and of death as a result of those sins. 
when the animals were sacrificed, you know, the blood was shed, the life was taken, all the sins that had been committed were confessed. Each time, it was an inescapable reminder to each person just how costly their sin truly was. Their consciences were not cleansed by these sacrifices. Sure, perhaps there was an ease of mind in knowing that they had followed the required steps, but would always be reminded of what was back there under that blood. When we read some of King David's words in Psalm 51, we can see his wrestling is not only with forgiveness of his sins, but a yearning to be cleansed all the way. His sins blotted, as he says in Psalm 51, and hidden from the face of God. In verse 4 of Hebrews 10, for it is impossible, impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So this order of sacrifice under the God-given law was insufficient to, one, remove the plague or curse of sin, and two, fully restore the personal daily relationship that had been torn from the Father and torn from us. And these sacrifices were insufficient because the blood being used with that was that of bulls and of goats. So in short, a greater blood was needed. A blood that carries more power than sin itself. A blood that runs down deeper than any sin. A blood that mends the heart and the mind. A blood that heals the soul. A blood that washes away the stains of the past and fills the worshiper with new life. New, greater blood was needed. But under the law, these sacrifices could only really serve to remind the worshipers of all they were not and all the more that they needed to be. So coming up next in Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, look at these verses in just a moment, these three verses, 5 through 7. We will see the author quote from Psalm 40, 6 through 8, from out of the Greek Septuagint, and attribute these words to Christ. So it's almost like a kind of, hey, are you guys seeing these words of prophecy? as being fulfilled? Just as a point of reference, the Septuagint was already a commonly used version of Scripture by this point, some 30 years after Christ's sacrifice, resurrection, and ascension. And it was the Old Testament, translated into Hebrew from the Greek, translated into he from Hebrew into Greek, by 70 of the best language scholars. So, let's look at Verse 5 through 7, Hebrews 10. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So consequently, or as a result, as we spoke of, of needing new and better blood, when Christ arrives, he says, speaking to the Father, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Or in other words, those were never intended to be the end game. So you prepared a body for me. Or, as a result, you ordained the exact moment and order for my arrival into time itself. In verse 6, in burnt and sin offerings, you've taken no pleasure. Or those offerings didn't grant you, your worshipers, your great pleasure of daily one-on-one -on -one communion with these worshipers. In verse 7, then I said, okay, here I am, ready to do your will, here to complete the plan. It is written of me in the scroll. If you look, you'll find me from the law all the way to the prophets. You should see me there. I'm on my way. Verse 8 and 9. 
of Hebrews 10. When he said above, and here the author is analyzing the words he has just attributed to Christ. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are all offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. So because God has neither desire nor pleasure in those sacrifices which are required under the law, then in order to change the rules of the game and bring himself what he does desire, in order to bring in a new covenant, he must do away with the old covenant first. In verse 10, and by that will, by that same will that said, I have come to do your will, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We are set apart for God's purposes. That's what sanctified means. Through Jesus, who did the will of the Father when he sacrificed his body once for all. In verse 11, and every priest stands daily at his service Offering, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Under the original God-given covenant, on their best day on the job, the earthly high priests were never able to accomplish the removal of people's sins. Let's look at verse 12 and verse 13 together. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. When Jesus accomplished in one sacrifice what could not be achieved under the old covenant, this same Jesus, resurrected in power, victory, and glory, he sat down at the right hand of God, the place, the position of honor and authority, to await the final fulfillment of the total victory that began with his resurrection. In verse 14, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Grab those words. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. By his single sacrifice, he has, has perfected for all time those who are set apart for God's holy purposes. If we've been washed in the blood of that sacrifice, if we've stood and claimed this Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, placing our faith in all the work that he did in his life and in his death, then we are already perfected in the Father's eyes. When the Father looks at us, he sees the righteousness of his dear Son. Our job now is to stay at the feet of Jesus, to depend upon Jesus, to hunger and thirst after his word, after his teachings, to recognize that we need Jesus in all that we say and do. In verses 15 and 16, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Just noting that this new covenant works from the inside out. The Holy Spirit giving witness as God puts his thoughts and his desires in our hearts. His new creations. The old covenant worked from the outside in and consisted of a list of do's and don'ts which really only prompted a carnal or flesh-bent man to rebel. 
Look at verse 17, and this is after he says these words in 15 and 16 about the new covenant and the hearts and minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. No more. Amazing, powerful, awesome. We overlook this far too often. God is making sure we understand how powerful and thorough this new covenant is. Verse 17 tells us God is expressly addressing all sins. And then for the benefit of the one who may have particular doubts that maybe this particular sin that no one else knows about or is, not, is not included, it can't be forgiven, it's not in this great plan of redemption, God is saying, yes, that one too. Yes, that one too. There is no sin committed with or without knowledge, hidden or visible, that can stand up and resist the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, all of them, and to cleanse us from some of the unrighteousness. Your translation is different. That's good. If yours is the right one. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That doesn't leave anything out. Remember that old hymn, Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood. The blood that washes white as snow. <laughs> Verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Since the blood of Jesus actually does away with our sins, they've been forgiven and forgotten. There is no need for offerings to be made in order to obtain forgiveness. Verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Are we seeing those words there? We are to, ha we are to have confidence boldness to enter into the presence of God. We have doubts because of who we are. We have doubts because of what we've said, what we've ha how we've handled something. But this isn't based on us. This is based on him. This is based on the work that he has done. Because of the work of Christ on our behalf, we are to have confidence, boldness as we come to him. Verse 20, by the new and living way, living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. The high priest alone dared to pass by the earthly curtain and then only once a year and after all the steps and sacrifices had been done in order and perfectly and much blood had been shed for sins. But now Christ has become our opening in that curtain through his broken body. And he asks all of us to come. Verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus as our great once for all sacrifice and our opening in the curtain to God has also become our great high priest. And he lives to intercede on our behalf to the Father. So then, what doubts are we still holding on to? What causes us to doubt? What causes us to wait and wait and delay? Has he not done everything, everything to remove our doubts? When you look at all he has done, you could, not to put words in God's mouth, but to just, you can hear him as though he were saying, what else do you need me to do to show you this is what I want? One on one. Has he not done everything to remove our doubts, to free us, to come to him with all confidence, anytime, for any reason, or for no reason at all. Just come. So because of all this, now we get to verse 22. Verse 22 is a message unto itself. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Draw near indicates that this is both our choice and our effort. We need to make this effort daily, staying in his word, staying at his feet in prayer, staying close to other believers who are doing the same. And we can draw near to him in full assurance of faith based on what we recognize he has done for us, for us to get it. We don't have to linger in the corners of doubt anymore. Just come to him. Draw near with a true heart, the scripture says. A true heart. A heart that confesses where it is. We can't hide anything from him. So we have to recognize that when we decide to hold something back, we're the ones stalling the conversation. Come with a true heart, a heart that confesses where it is. Whatever in our heart is broken, know that he can fix it. Whatever in our heart is hurt or wounded, we know he can heal it. Whatever in our heart has been hardened or calloused or jaded or whatever adjective you want to add there, he can renew that. Whatever is weak, he can strengthen. Whatever is doubting, he can provide assurances. But draw near with a true heart. Draw near with our hearts sprinkled clean. We can't come before him with sin on us or sin in our hearts. While these scriptures have told us, for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, no more sin sacrifice is necessary, that doesn't eliminate our responsibility of confessing and repenting of whatever sin may be in our heart as we try to come before him. We've got to address it. Perhaps our prayer might sound a little like this. If it sounds rehearsed, it's probably probably it is. Lord, please search my heart. Show me what you want me to see. Lord, I'm sorry I did not handle the situation well this morning with my wife or the kids. I know I need to grow in my trust in you. You will help me with the patience and grace. You will teach me how to lead them in more wisdom as I depend upon you, as I wait on you, as I trust you, as I seek for you to show me what you want me to see in the midst of these circumstances, in the heat of the conversation. It is a purging. In this moment, it's a purging of anything that is in the way of full communion with God's Spirit. It is aligning our hearts and our minds with his. And watch him pour open the floodgates. (laughs) This is all that he has been waiting for. This is exactly what all the great plan of redemption was set in motion for. For this. For this daily, personal, one-on-one communion. Honest, heart-to-heart When we doubt how much he desires it, look at the torn veil and the cross. You're not wasting his time. Don't waste yours. Just get to him with it, whatever it is. Draw near with a true heart, with bold confidence, with hearts sprinkled clean. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. How can we do that? For he who has promised is faithful. This new covenant depends on the promises of God and not on our own works. Hallelujah for that. 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. It is important that we as fellow Christians have concern for each other and encourage each other to good works. This isn't a, hey, show me your report card today, what did you do for God today, kind of encouragement. (laughs) This is staying in prayer for the body as a whole. It's asking God to open up our heart and our mind to the one in our midst who might be struggling, who might need encouragement, who might need a friend, who might need a conversation, 
just need a couple moments of prayer. Perhaps simply a time now for a ministry of presence with somebody. It's praying for someone today and then following up with them in a day or two. It's encouraging others to stand strong in the Lord in the face of all that opposes them at school, on the job, in the community, maybe the family. And last but not least, it's verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Perhaps in different spaces and times, we've all been a witness to this verse being used more as an anvil, maybe, than an encouragement. But it is the cry of my heart tonight that we allow the Lord to set aside those voices, set aside those experiences, and embrace the eternal truths captured in this precious passage. Regular gathering with other Christians helps to keep the whole body of believers functioning and growing properly, growing spiritually. Just like in our physical body, there is often an invisible healing and growth that is taking place just as God's people gather together. There is silent spiritual accountability that occurs where God's Spirit speaks and guides just in the course of our fellowship. There is the glory of the joined worship, where as Scripture tells us, He actually inhabits, dwells in the praises of His people. But something even more happens. Have we considered the blessings that God manifests for our time together in fellowship? For those who meet regularly, you know what I'm talking about. How many times have we had obstacles to come, but we came anyway, and we come in empty, we come in struggling, we come in weighed down, and we leave full. We leave rejoicing. We leave worshiping. And for those who are shut-ins or completely unable to meet together, I believe God provides with a special grace a presence, a special belonging, a special connectedness as they would watch our services unfold online. But for those who, by matter of choice, follow our services online rather than join us in person, I would like to address these next couple of thoughts to you. We pray for you. We love you. And we know that you love us. Maybe you're overwhelmed with circumstances and pressures and maybe not really sure where the extra effort will come from. We pray for you and we trust our great God to guide you. Maybe you've contemplated whether or not you will actually get a greater blessing for being here rather than following us online. While I'm not choosing this moment to simply oppose that conclusion, there is one question I gently ask you to prayerfully consider. We usually think in terms of the blessing we receive for attending, but have we recognized the blessing others get by our joining the gathering also? Will we prayerfully consider the blessings that God has slated for another believer to receive by our coming, by our joining the worship together? That is my humble request today. We all need each other. We need each other. There are 50 plus references to one anothering in Scripture. Several passages speak to where one body part cannot say to another part, we don't need you. And in the same way, no part of the body can deem itself as unnecessary either. We are all part of one body, one faith, one Lord. And he has designed these blessings. He has done this intentionally. He's designed these blessings around our regular interactions together at his feet. We need to remain connected. We need the blessings, the encouragement, the joint praise, and yes, the accountability that that brings. 
And now the author pivots in his writing to give yet another warning. Moving forward in our text, the next four verses we'll read together, verse 26 through 29. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of just two or three witnesses. How much worse how much worse punishment do you think then will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Strong, strong words. We're, we don't want to break this up. This is, this, th these verses we need to read carefully. We need to read together. We need to understand the context here. Verse 29 is defining willful sin and a rejection of this plan of salvation offered through the Son of God. The sin that will condemn a man is the sin against God's loving provision for our salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Jesus spoke in Matthew 12, 31 and 32, and said, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, Jesus, will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Talk about recognizing how important John 14, 6 stands out now. There is no other way to God but through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only sacrifice that God will accept for our sins is the sacrifice he prepared for us in Jesus. We simply must accept this sacrifice on our behalf and receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. In verse 30 and 31. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you recall those beautiful prophetic verses that open up chapter 61 in Isaiah? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening of the prison to those who are bound. And then what does it say next? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. This same God who brings all this deliverance establishes a year of the Lord's favor, but only needs a day to exact all vengeance. Think about that. Truly fearful to fall into the hands of the living God. I think I'm just good with choosing to stay in Christ. How about you? Amen. Verses 32 and 33. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. Many of these Hebrew Christians had already experienced great persecution for their faith in Jesus. In the earlier years, this oppression came from their fellow Jews as they were often considered as traitors of their heritage or even of their families. Then as the winds changed in Rome, this persecution came from everywhere. In verse 34, and he's continuing this thought, but for you had compassion on those in prison. Even while you were going through all of this persecution, you had compassion on those in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, 
since you knew you had you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. <clears throat> The author is saying, despite these waves of persecution, recall how you, in the power of his might, still had room for compassion for those in prison, helping take care of their needs, all while joyfully losing your own stuff. <laughs> so clear was your recognition that you had a much greater possession awaiting you. You have a much greater possession awaiting you, one that cannot be taken by anyone, and it is eternal. Hallelujah. Verse 35, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. This verse seems to carry more weight when we recognize the value of our reward in this exchange. The free, un unhindered, personal, daily, intimate fellowship with him is our great reward here, as well as our place in heaven with him for always after here. These are the visible rewards. But what about the third reward? We can come to him confidently. Not because of who we are, what we've done or not done, but because of how much this means to him and the work he has done for us to be in his presence. In verse 36, it says, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Endurance is key. It is key throughout Scripture and is key in our relationship with Jesus. How many times do we read throughout Scripture, they who endure to the end shall be saved? Pressing towards the mark, forgetting what lies behind. In other words, do not take our eyes off the prize. What we need to know here is our willingness to persevere, to endure. When we have reached the end of our strength, the end of our sight, the end of our capacity, this moment of choosing to endure is absolutely pure trust in Jesus. This is that moment of, I trust you beyond any outcomes. And this trust moves God's hand and heart. Verse 37 says, for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteousness, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The author here is quoting Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4. Another prophet who seemed at his end with all the evil that was going on around him. And as this ancient prophet records God's own words in this Old Testament passage, you can almost hear the passionate plea the Hebrews author is making as he quotes those same words. Hey, I know you're going through some stuff right now. I know you're in the midst of deep challenge right now. Some of it may not make any sense. Some of it may be going against the very fiber of your being. Perhaps you vacillate between standing up and defending your rights versus silently waiting it out in the shadows. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. You need an answer. You need relief. You need help. You are ready to receive all those promises you've been clinging to this whole time. I think we all have places in our Bible. The pages are worn a little bit more than in other places. Ready to receive those promises that we've been clinging to this whole time. God knows. He knows your maker, your defender, your savior, and your deliverer knows. He won't let one ounce of your trust go unrewarded. I'm going to repeat that in case we missed it. He won't let one ounce of your trust go unrewarded just because you have not yet seen a response. Was it in the psalm it says he ca captures every tear in a bottle? 
He's capturing our tears. How valuable do you think our trust is to him? Just trust him and trust him alone. What do I mean by that? Trust him above and beyond any desired outcome. I know when we're in pain. I know we're in the middle of struggle. I know when we need an answer. We know the answer that we're praying for. We know the outcome that we're praying for. But what happens when we shift from praying for the gift to praying for the giver, trusting the giver? I know you know what I need. I know you know what this looks like more than I do. So I trust you because of who you are. He knows what we need long before we have that need. And when he does return, as the scripture says, he, when he does deliver, There will be no delay in his reward, no delay in his vengeance. And finally, verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Don't be like some who have chosen to walk away abandoning their beliefs abandoning their faith in the work of Jesus Christ. So we, like the Hebrews author, make the same plea to you today. Stand strong. Stand strong and know in whom you believe. There is no anchor more sure. There is no rock more steadfast There is no mountain more of a refuge than Jesus Christ. Cling to Jesus and live forever. He is our eternal deliverer. This is why Jesus is better. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Would you bow your heart with me, please? Father, we are just so grateful for your love for us. We're going to say it and keep saying it, but we mean it with all of our heart. Lord, help us as your children to never become numb to what you have done for us. Remind us. Remind us how far you brought us. Remind us of all that you've done in our lives. And remind us of the promises that you've made that still lie ahead for us to see. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for every heart that's here. We lift this all up to you now in the name of Jesus, praising you for all that you're doing. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Of all that you've done 
and the life I have because of the sun. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out with my my soul.
with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all and I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrendered all I am is yours so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all and I'll stand my soul Completely 